Welcome to Backstage with Becca B with special guest Shalina Kennedy. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Backstage with Becca B. On this episode, her impressive resume includes the role of Mary Magdalene in Jesus Christ Superstar, the show she made her Broadway debut in, playing Carol King over 1,200 times in Beautiful, the Carol King musical, and Dina in the band's visit on tour. She's also a singer-songwriter with an album called What You Find in a Bottle, and she's written an original musical called Call It Love. Please welcome Shalina Kennedy. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you for joining me on this today. Oh, thank you for having me. Of course. I'm so excited. Your resume is insanity. It's so... <laughs> thank you has it been weird uh during this time not like not doing any theater and because I feel like you've been doing theater pretty consistently over the years oh yes absolutely it's very very strange it's um yeah I mean it's also kind of peaceful and and you know those of us who you know are lucky enough to you know have a a home and a place to go back to, you know what I mean? I think it's, uh, I mean, it's affording me some time with my family, like my parents um, are living really close by and, you know, it's time with my son, which, you know, you can never get back. So, <laughs> you yeah, know, like, checks and balances. But yeah, for sure. I definitely miss theater. But, you know, I'm still doing some stuff. I'm doing concerts and things like that. So and a lot of online things. So that's helpful. Yeah, theater theater performers are very resilient in that way as I've mentioned in a lot of my previous interviews Mm -hmm. we sure are (laughs) find a way they find a way and they find a way to to bring virtual stuff to audiences who miss theater as much as the performers miss theater which is really nice yeah absolutely so have you always known you wanted to be a theater performer in the industry Yes, I I have uh, I've known since I was four years old that I wanted to be on stage. <laughs> oh my it was either I wanted to be um, uh, I wanted to be like an environmental or an animal rights activist. Like I was so extreme. I was like one way or the other, and um, and then I was like, and I also want to be on stage. But the thing was, is that I had so many interests. Like I wanted, I was in you know classical ballet, classical piano. And then eventually like classical voice and acting. And so I had to figure out what I wanted to do. And I had a scholarship to Queen's University to study voice, to study music and be an opera singer. So I was going to be an opera singer. And then I was like, (gasps) I didn't want to give up my dancing and my acting. And so I thought, well, I'll go to Sheridan College and I'll... um, you know, I'll do the musical theater program because then I don't have to give up anything. And then that's where I learned how to like, I had learned how to belt. I learned how to do something other than, you know, (laughs) plies and tendus. (laughs) So you have opera experience under your belt. That was my first, yeah, my first training was as a classical singer. Wow. Do you think that's helped you to have that opera training like in Broadway? Um, yes, yes. For sure. I mean, I think that any classical training gives you a solid foundation, you know? Yeah. Um, It's also, I I think at the beginning, it hindered me a little bit, you know, just because I I couldn't really see outside the box of the classical way, you know what I mean? But that was true for dance as well. You know, it was, um, it was tricky to get outside of the, you know, sometimes like, I remember my first improv class when I had to learn how to like, improv on the piano, you know, or just like read a chart and, you know, (laughs) play around. (laughs) Like I was like, ooh, if it's not like written on the page, I didn't know what to do. So it sort of forced me into this other way of, you know, of, um, of thinking about music and dance and singing. And, you know, I remember like almost flunking out of pop rock class in school because I didn't know what my voice was. Like I'd only ever sung, you know, classical music or, you know, uh, certain you know traditional or classic musical theater or like the golden age right I sort of stuck to those yeah those ones and so when my teacher said um who's been like an incredible role model when she said no you've got to find out who you are as an artist I didn't even know what that meant I was like well I I thought I knew and so I had to go around and you know just try to figure out like aside from that you know how I wanted to express myself it's probably helped you over the years with like vocal stamina and like vocal control too because I feel like with opera singing you have to have like a lot of like control yes and I was always taught to to stop relying on the mic so much so I you know I was very good at 
you know, being healthy with my voice, taking care of my instrument and being able to project in a very healthy way to use my stage voice, you know, so I, I wasn't always singing like this or talking like this, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. a different way of doing it, right? But also you need those other colors in your voice, like especially now a days, you know, when musicals are now so contemporary and so pop rock and, you know, um, there's just so many styles now and it's important to be able to do it all. So I don't know, it's like... Yeah, so you're from Canada and you built a solid career in the US. How did you, come, like, when did you come here and what brought you to the United States to do theater? Well, you know, I'd been, I'd been uh, auditioning for Broadway shows for years when I was in Canada. Um, but, it, but it's tricky because every time there was an audition, I'd have to get on a plane, fly down, find a place. To, like, it was really, really difficult to do it from Canada. Um, and ironically, um, my first role, um, well, first role in the U.S. was actually Sophie and Mamma Mia. I did uh, play Sophie like for two and a half years on the U.S. national tour, the first the U.S. national tour. And it was so much fun. Um, but then I didn't really go back until I played Mary in Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. And it was ironically, you know, the Stratford Shakespeare Festival that in, in Stratford, Ontario, in Canada, that brought me to Broadway. <laughs> and I always joke with Josh Young, who got the Tony nomination that year for his role as Judas, you know, his performance. And he always said, like, I can't believe that I had to play this part in Canada to get to Broadway. Like, he'd been trying to get to Broadway for years, too. And he's like, how is it that, like, this small Canadian town and this Canadian company <laughs> took me to New York? Like, he's American. <laughs> it's just funny. And, like, it was after he had tried to, you know, like, settle down in Canada. And so you never know how you're going to get there. It was a surprise to me. And you did a lot of shows with that production company in Canada, I saw on your resume. With yeah, I mean, I, I was with them for three seasons. And so, you know, we, I did two shows per season. And so I did I did six shows with them and then a bunch of, bunch of other projects as well, like concert work and things like that. Why, the, why do you think the break between Mamma Mia and Jesus Christ Superstar was it just like, did you have, did you want to like position yourself like in Canada after a tour and like not travel and stuff? Oh gosh, I wish I had that much control. <laughs> no, I just, um, you know, I, I, I went back to Canada after the tour closed because I wanted to be home and yeah. I really, you know, I, I was excited about some of the opportunities that were at home for me uh, in Canada. And so that's when I got into like the Shaw Festival. And there's so much importance, you know, especially in Canada placed on classical training and, you know, working like Canada's based on a, um, a, a, a festival sort of um you know, um, I guess, how do I explain this? We're, we're sort of a little more British in the way that we're, that we operate. <laughs> and so we have a lot of companies, right? Where you're a part of the, we, you're a part of like the bigger company. So the Charlottetown festival or the Shaw festival or the Stratford festival, those are kind of like the bread and butter of Canadian theater. And that's how we're all trained. And that's how we all come up in the world of theater. And it's a little different in the States. I mean, there, I know there are lots of rep companies in the States as well, but it's a different, there's a star system and there's this whole different way of doing it in the States. And so, you know, I guess I wanted to come back home and, you know, because Mamma Mia was pretty much one of the first jobs I got, you know, in my career. And I guess I needed like the foundation of being able to do the classics. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> so I went back to school and to the conservatory at Stratford and got some more classical training in my acting. And so it just kind of rounded me out as a, as a performer. So by the time I got to Broadway, you know, years down the road, I'd had like six years of, um, you know, of, of like, classical theater and you know all of these rep companies under my belt and I was a much I think I was a much more solid and grounded performer by that time I and that probably helped you a lot and probably made you feel more a lot uh very comfortable when you got to Broadway I'm there's a lot of Canada show, like shows that start in Canada as workshops that have gone to Broadway did you expect the production of Jesus Christ Superstar you were in to go to Broadway was that known before no, it was always a hope, but you know, and it's funny because this is a little known fact that Toronto, Canada used to be the third largest uh, center for, especially for new works, for new theater, especially musical theater in the world. So it was New York, London, and Toronto. Um, that was when Live Ant was, you know, was in its yeah. heyday. Um, so, you know, a lot of people don't know that like Showboat came out of Toronto and like all of these big shows, you know, like started in Toronto, um, uh, like, you know, 
like I always remember like opening night I mean I don't remember because I wasn't there but like opening night of like Julie Andrews in Camelot like that happened you know in Toronto I think at the O'Keefe Center um anyway I'm not great with history but I think it's like, <laughs> probably pretty accurate um but anyway but the, you know um we sort of lost our third place title like you know over the last um 20 years but we've we've really started to make it back and we shows like come from away and the drowsy chaperone like there's some really great ones that have come out of canada so you know i think that makes us proud <laughs> what was your audition experience like for uh jesus christ superstar oh geez well i i didn't have one to be honest i mean i i, I always hate when other people say that, so i hope i don't offend anybody but it's, <laughs> it's part of the company right and you know so you got, uh, yeah and it, you know, sometimes what happens is like they'll, it depends, like for certain roles, like when I played uh, Evita, right, they they had me come in and audition for that part because it was a bit outside the box and they were like, is this our girl? We don't know until she comes into the room. But I mean, par being part of the company means that like they knew my work really well. Des Mackinac knew my work, you know, from before and, um, you know, and I'd done a lot of, they obviously knew me as a performer. So it's it's like, well, auditions are kind of like when they know you so well, it's kind of sometimes they don't need you to come into the room, right? So they were just like, this is your offer for next year. And I was thrilled because I've always wanted to do Jesus Christ Superstar. And, and I'd done it before when I was younger. I think I'd understudied Mary or something. And I, I was I was always a, I was a dancer in my 20s. And so, you know, when I was uh, when I was in that show, I did a lot of um, I did a big dancer track and understudied that role. So I always, you know, I'd always hoped that it would come back into my life and that I'd be able to play that part. So I was like, yes, Stratford's doing it. I can't wait. So, so after hearing you sing in shows for like a couple of years, they were like, OK, she would fit this role perfectly for our production. Yeah let's make it happen it's also to remember too like with you know with in terms of the producer eye there's always more to it too than being a good fit like i think sometimes people are good fit for certain things but it's whatever's going to sell the show the best as well like that's how people are thinking about it so sometimes as actors we think oh it's about my skill or my talent well that's part of it but it's also like where you fit in the season and where they need other people and how they build the whole thing together yeah, and it's about like how the cast fits as a whole. I feel like too, like the chemistry that the cast has. It's like, can these people work well together on stage? Will the audience believe what's happening on stage if we have these people in the show together? Mm -hmm. Type thing. So, what was your reaction when you heard that it was going that the production you were in was going to Broadway and you were going to be making your Broadway debut? Oh my gosh, we were all so excited. Well, I mean, it's one thing to take a few cast members to New York with the production. Yeah. I mean, it's, first of all, it's one thing for the show to go, period, to New York. That's great. And then second of all, it's, it's amazing for them to take some people. The fact that they took all of us was unbelievable. Like, I think it was most of our Broadway debuts. And so it was, you know, very, very, very exciting for everybody in, in, in the company. And, um, yeah, we were just kind of over the moon. Like there were rumblings about it. And there was like this rumor that we were going and we thought, oh, well, they'll probably take maybe like a couple of us, maybe like one or two, <laughs> maybe more if we're lucky. <laughs> so they like brought us into a room and Des and Judy came in. Their Judy was our producer and Des came in and just said, okay, we've got some news for you. And you know, he told they told us and we all flipped out and cried and hugged each other. And it was just amazing. So it was a bit, you know, a lot of pressure and a bit nerve wracking and you know, making the transition. And I think a big group of Canadians, like a big Canadian company coming to New York yeah. was its own thing too. Is like, oh, will we be accepted by the community? Are they going to be happy that we're here? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of those questions too. How do you prepare for something like that to make your Broadway debut? And like to, I mean, I'm sure it's like, go, like it's like going on stage again, but in a different location, but still it's a big deal. You think Broadway debut and you're like, whoa, like that, that's huge. Well, I mean, that's that's the question, right? Like, and that's the work and is trying to not make it a big deal because really the work is the work is the work. And I used to say this when I was directing or when I was teaching, you know, like people would say, well, you know, this is, I remember teaching um, or directing a, a small production of, I think it was Fiddler on the Roof or I was choreographing it or something in a, in a small town in Canada. And they said, oh, Shalina, you know, it's only... Uxbridge or whatever they said and I said no I said you stop right there I said the work is the work is the work whether you do this show on Broadway or Uxbridge or Toronto or London or anywhere 
you're playing that role. And so give your heart and soul to that role and make it about the work and not about the ego of where you are and wh what stage you're playing it on, right? Yeah. So I think all of us had to remember that like, well, yes, yeah, is our Broadway debut and there's a lot of glitter around that. But really, it's the same show that we've always been doing, no matter what, because we took it to La Jolla before New York. I mean, it's been the same show the whole time. So let's not lose, you know, what makes it great, which is the grounded um, ease of it. And the fact that we've been playing that show together for such a long time, just stick with that, you know, and, and don't make it a big um, a big deal, you know, because that just creates a bunch of fear and nerves unnecessarily. Speaking of it being the same show from the beginning stages to Broadway, did it change at all? I know like some sh shows before they go to Broadway are different from when they actually go to Broadway and like the staging changes and stuff. Did the staging change in between because of the Broadway? Like No, it, it didn't really, not very much. The only thing that changed was we added a few tech elements because we had um, some you know, moving parts that came out that used to be operated by actors. And it, it was just, it was pretty much the same. It's just that it had a motor. So it was really, that was the only thing that changed. Um, so a couple of tech elements and, uh, and then we had a couple of cast changes. So Brent Carver uh, ended up not going with us, which was, you know, unfortunate, but a uh, good thing is we got Tom Hewitt. So it was wonderful to, you know, to have done that show with both of those fine actors. And that's, that's pro that was probably exciting for him to get the opportunity. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I think, you know, Tom loves working with Des and, you know, it was just a, it was a fun time. So getting to bring a story like Jesus Christ Superstar to life and step into the shoes of Mary Magdalene when like, it's like, it's a factual story, but it's told in a different way on stage. And it's told to music of rock, of like rock opera music. Mm -hmm. How how exciting was that, and how did you put yourself into Mary's shoes and take on that pretty emotional role? Yeah, well, that's a really good. I struggled to be honest with you because I mean, you know, let's like facts. Let's look at facts. Like my mother was, you know, raised me as a major feminist, and so I sort of never was in the school of thought that believed that Mary was actually ever a prostitute. So it was it was difficult for me to sort sort of divorce myself from fact, fiction, storytelling. And the great way that, you know, uh, Des approached it and what he helped me with is he said, you know, just stop worrying about that and just focus on what makes the most exciting story. We're telling a story. So yeah. let's just separate ourselves from what was true, what was in the Bible, what people believe, blah, 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 what the relationships are supposed to be. Um, and let's just tell the most interesting story. And for me, with that, with that story, what is always to me the most interesting uh, is... Or I guess, you know, what feels a little boring to me is when, you know, Jesus is played as the hero and Judas is the bad guy and Mary is the poor victim who's in love with Jesus. Like, okay, we got that. So what makes it a little more exciting is when you play Jesus as the flawed, you know, hero. Judas as the hero, as like somebody who's actually fighting for something interesting that we believe in and then it all okay. goes south. And then Mary as, you know, the powerful right hand person to Jesus. And if they're in a love triangle and they're battling, then you've got something to fight against. And then you've got, you know, preconceptions to fight against. And then you've got somewhere to go. And that's the, I think that's the exciting twist that Des put on it is he made it a love triangle. He made it like we started here and then people shifted. Yeah. Then Judas did things and we're like, wait a minute we were buying it at the beginning now why did you do that to him and Jesus was like mm, not sure what you're and then he would go and then you realize that he was right the whole time and then Mary is all conflicted about it so it was I just thought it was exciting right like if you're if you divorce yourself from what you think it should be and you you know you really make it about the relationships then I think you have a really exciting story so I was really proud of the production and I love digging into that version of Mary and you it sounds like you really made it your own it's so was it, was it, I found that the fans, I worked Jesus Christ Superstar at Pantages the last time it came to Pantages last year. And I found that the fans were like really passionate about the show who came to the show. Did that help you with the, with your portrayal of her? Um, no, I think it, uh, you know, they are very, very, very passionate about the show. And, you know, and I think people are like that in general with musicals, like people, uh, you know, they're like, if you look at, I don't know, Little Shop of Horrors, right? There are people who are like deep fans of that show who are like, it's got to be played this way. And this is the, the way that it is. Um, and so I think that that's wonderful. And it also can be a little bit restrictive, right? If like, if there's like one way that, 
we think that a show should be done, it's, you know, or a Vita, right? Like if we think it's got to be a certain way or we're basing it on the Patti Lapone version, then it doesn't really leave room for any other interpretation or any other colors. And so I think that, you know, with this show, I think the fans were, um, they were open to, to Des's version. I mean, from what I experienced, uh, people, people generally really were responded very well to it. And I mean, you can't go wrong with that music. The music is incredible. It's so exciting. Um, you know, so I think people really, really did enjoy it. And I don't think we ever lost the heart of what it was or what it is. You know, we, I think we just, we added a few deeper layers to it that I frankly, you know, really enjoyed. <laughs> and the special thing about live theater, I always say is that when you see productions of a show, it's always going to be different. Like there's going to be different productions of certain shows. There's mm -hmm. going to be different people on stage for the same show that for the same production of the show you saw. It's going to be a little different every time, mm -hmm. depending on people on stage. Like a lot of factors go into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I love what you were saying earlier about theater is theater because you've done beautiful. You've done it for over. 1,200 performances, mm -hmm. which is insanity. And you've done it on tour. You've played Carol on tour and Broadway. So was your first audition initially for the tour for Beautiful? No, no, no. no. The only reason I went on tour is to do it in Toronto. So okay. it wasn't really me going on tour. It was me doing it in Toronto, which is me, you know, oh, doing okay. it for the Mervishes back home in Toronto. So um, the I, I took a break from doing it on Broadway to go and play it in my in, in my home. Oh, uh, so that's kind of what that was. And the you know the audition was I was actually up for it in the beginning. Uh, I was up for that role. <laughs> right I'm from, that surprised. from like the very first workshop, I was doing a Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder out in California and they flew me out and I didn't get it and I was so bummed and I went back and did you know gentleman's guide or whatever and then it kept coming up for me but then because of the projects that I had like I actually got to the finals of the auditions for the very first you know San Francisco to Broadway and wasn't able to go because I was doing another project at the time and I was devastated and I thought oh my gosh maybe I'm never going to get to play this part and, you know, I did what I never do when I hid my sides and my music from my audition, like in a little bookcase, because normally I just throw them out and I forget about it and I go on to the next thing. But I kept them and I, and I sort of put out a little hope to the universe that maybe someday it would come back again. So when Jesse was leaving and they wanted somebody to come in and, and take over for her, they called and they were like, you know, is Shalene available to come and do this? And I was like, no, you do this if they're not serious because I don't want to be brokenhearted again. And they were like, no, 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 they're very serious. Uh, and at the time I was, you know, I was very, very pregnant <laughs> with my son and I ended up going down. I was almost, oh my gosh, I was almost at the end of my pregnancy. It was just before like the cutoff time for flying. So I went down, did the, I mean, it, it was not so much an audition as it was me putting myself on tape to audition for Carol King because the creative team had all approved me, but Carol needed to give me the, the check mark, you know? So I, I was like, oh gosh, I mean, it's all well and good for the creative team to want me, but if she doesn't, then, you know, <laughs> I'm sort of lost. So I went back home and, and I waited for the call. And then, you know, that Monday after the weekend, my agent called me in the morning and, you know, I answered the phone and I was like, oh my gosh, hi, hi, hi. And he said, no, 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 honey, it's not about um, beautiful. It's about something else. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what's it about? And he said, oh, I just wanted to know if you could get me a couple of tickets. And I said, tickets to what? And he said, you're opening that on Broadway. You got the job. And so oh, I was so <laughs> it was a great way of telling me. And yeah, you know, I was so grateful that she approved, you know, approved what I did and that I could actually take over for Jesse. And it was fantastic. It was just such a wonderful time in my life playing that role. And I feel like also you were part of the, like, Beautiful ran for so long on Broadway. It had, like, it had to run longer than a lot of shows I feel like typically get. Yes. And you were a part of keeping that show alive and making it making it new and fresh every night. And like the mm -hmm. audiences, I've heard so many fantastic things about your performance in the show. My friends are all like, oh my God, she was <laughs> incredible in the show. I'm like, what? You get like, ask her this, ask her this about Beautiful. So, I mean, how special was it to get the yes from Carol King herself? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, honestly, it was a dream come true. When I when I read the show the first time around, I, I mean, I wept at the end. I was crying. I just I connected to her and to that story. It's such a and it's a gorgeous story about you know, um, well, it's about 
so many love stories about our love story with you know with the music about you know these two friends like these two couples I mean who are friends it's about the love story between you know Jerry and Carol and about Cynthia and Barry like there's so much to celebrate in that show and it's about forgiveness um, and about you know becoming this strong woman and coming into your own like I just there's so much about the show that I love um, and it's also like you know, Carol isn't tr necessarily like traditionally the sort of like, oh, strong woman, but she is a very, very strong woman in a different way than we're used to seeing. And it's, I think it's her quiet sort of like step by step, like I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep making the right choices and making choices from compassion and kindness instead of, you know, um, the way that we sort of tend to see like how we have to be strong. You know, I, I just love that version of, of strength within a woman and or within anybody really. Um, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for her and for the way that she has, um, she's lived her life and, you know, she's had four kids and she still managed to have this incredible career and she's just been a, an amazing, amazing role model. So I feel very lucky. How familiar with, were you with her whole story before playing her and what, like, what did you learn during your research to play her? I knew nothing at all, to be honest. I didn't even know what a big fan I was of hers until I started wow. doing the research. I mean, I, I loved her album Tapestry, but I didn't know she wrote so many number one hits. I had no idea. Um, you know, and I think like, you've got a friend I always associated with James Taylor. And so when I found out like all of those stories, like when I found out that James Taylor and Joni Mitchell are actually the backup singers on Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? I was like, oh, cause I'd always been a fan of like all three of those artists, you know? <laughs> and when I realized like how they made music together and how they were, you know, they like Carol would run over and play piano on James's album. And then Joni would be recording next door to Carol and they would all come in and sing backup on each other's album. Like the way that that, Nothing. Music happened is so different than what we do today. You know, yeah. it's very much like the me mentality in my solo career, which also, you know, was a thing back in those days, but it was like that Laurel Canyon kind of making music together vibe and those sounds that came out of that time. Like it was just really, really special. So I learned a lot about the industry, about the music, about Carol herself. I mean, I knew nothing about her private life. Um, and, you know, and then through knowing about Carol, I learned a lot about Joni Mitchell, and James Taylor, and like all of these incredible, um, all of these incredible artists, you know, and, uh, and how important all those artists were to Carol. Like every time she, she does a performance, she always makes a point of going through the band and going through each of the musicians and like, you know, really giving them the respect that they deserve. Yes. Yes, the appreciation. And I love, I love that when artists do that. So a good portion of Beautiful is Carol's music journey on stage. And like you see her growth as an artist when you're sitting in the audience. And I feel like the audience is learning her story as it goes along too, because maybe people didn't dive into, maybe people are fans and haven't dived into like her life story, like Beautiful tells it. How do you portray the growth of Carol on stage? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the beauty of Doug's script, Doug McGrath, is that, you know, it, it's all there for you. You just have to, you just have to kind of, you have to play the script, right? Or let it yeah. play, let it play you, <laughs> some people say. Um, so I think, you know, there's a beautiful progression from her being 16 and writing her first number one hit to then her being sort of in her, um, you know, later on in life, sort of post-divorce, you know, <laughs> version that we find when she's in, at Carnegie Hall. And there is a big, 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 um, you know, a big journey there for her and for everybody, really. You know, Barry and Cynthia also have a lovely journey, and so does Jerry. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, there's everything assists in doing that. Like, we see also her, her looks change. You know, she goes from this very insecure kind of teenager who is like yeah. you know, talking about all the things that are wrong with her, her wrong in quotation marks that she thinks are wrong with her, how she compares to other girls. Um, and then she's able to, you know, gain more and more confidence, but she does go through a period of being very, very insecure and unsure of herself. And, um, and I love seeing like the physical changes in her, you know, like from that, the short hair to then like, she just kind of lets herself be a bit more natural. And then she like blossoms into this kind of like seventies chick. <laughs> I love it. How long do the transformations take backstage? Well, it's all, it's pretty quick. I mean, the, the show is a series of like moderately quick changes. So there's only yeah. like really one lightning speed 
a quick change at the beginning when she goes from 16 until, um, or from, you know, the Carol at Carnegie Hall to the 16 year old. And that's like a 12 second change, which is insane. It's like wig, costume, everything. It's like, go, 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 go. And then like running down the stage. But the other ones are pretty quick. It's like, okay, go back, have a drink of water. You can powder a little bit, get your clothes on, and we go on. But none of them are, are relaxed enough that you can actually go to your dressing room. So they're, they all happen backstage. So you're basically like at the wings of the stage the entire show, just like yeah. waiting to go back to the, on to the next scene. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're always, I mean, but that's sort of what I love too about shows like that is when you, I enjoy getting on the train and staying on the train until we stop the train. Do you know what I mean? Like I, yeah. sometimes it's, it's even more exhausting when you're in a show. Like I was in like Forum, for instance, it's a fantastic show. A funny thing happened on the way to the Forum and I played Philia. But in that show, Philia has like a chunk and you're on and you're doing your thing and then you're backstage and you're like reading a magazine, but not for too long because you can't get lost in it. You got to like go back on again, but you got about 20 minutes and then you're like <laughs> back on again. But when you're in a show like Beautiful and you're playing Carol, you're just, you're just in it. You're just in it. And that's the end of it until intermission. You can take a little break, but even in, at intermission, you've only got about five minutes to have a cup of tea and then you've got to get back into your costume for act two and then you start again. So it's got a good rhythm. That totally makes sense because the, because the adrenaline probably helps you perform too. Well, yeah, you just, you never dip in and out. You're just like, you're on it. Until yeah. Do you feel like, because you're a singer songwriter too, which I want to get into earlier. Do you feel like that helped you make Carol your own in the show? Um, I mean, maybe to a certain extent, I mean, I don't in any way put myself in the category, you know, with like Carol, uh, I, you know, but I, I do write for sure, you know, and I've been writing for a long time. I, I mean, I guess the only way that it, it connected us was I, I think I understand the vulner, the vulnerability of putting your work out there. Although ironically, Carol and I have very different opposing insecurities. I've always been terrified of playing piano in front of people and she's always been terrified of singing in front of people. Okay. So we have kind of like the opposite fears, but also that helps me to play her because I get that that fear that I have of playing piano. She feels every time she, or she used to when she opens her mouth to sing in front of people. So, um, you know, I get that at Carnegie Hall, you know, when she would open her mouth to sing so far away, it's the, you know, the fear and the vulnerability and the insecurity around that, I understand. And that's what makes her so relatable. And so, you know, like she's, she's a human being. She's not, she's not perfect. She's got fears and insecurities just like the rest of us. <laughs> and so, you know, I think we can all relate to that. Oh my gosh, I've never known anybody who didn't have a insecurity of some kind. I mean, if, if there's anyone out there who doesn't have an insecurity of some kind, how? Yeah, or like, please call me and tell me how you did it. <laughs> yes, exactly, because like, I, I need some life coaching from that person. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of piano, you don't actually play piano on stage as Carol. Do you think that that's hard to like, not to like, pretend to play piano and like, make it believable? Like, how is that? Yeah, I think it's different for everybody, and it depends on your level of, um, you know, of experience with the piano. I mean, because I play, uh, I don't play particularly well, but I do play, and I play for my auditions. So I do know, like, I learned a lot of the songs, uh, you know, I learned the chord progressions, and so I, and you know, and I, I, you just, you just play the song. I mean, you just play okay. the song, and, um, a lot of it was sort of gobble gobbledygook, like the, one of the fun things that Jason Howland, who was the musical director, and I used to do is he would tease me sometimes and change up the solos. And so I'd have to sort of like, oh, God, he's playing it. Like, I'd have to, like, really listen and follow along, you know. So it was keeping it fresh and interesting musically was fun for me because I have some ease with the piano. Um, but I think, like, you know, for other people who might not uh, – be able to play it was a little trickier you know for some understudies who had to like go and study you know it was there was a lot of work involved and um but you know but jason was fantastic like, he was he was so supportive and you know everybody in the music team was really patient and they would take all of the carols through everything that needed to happen and you you know you just had time to work on it and if you know that piano is not your forte like there's time you know before you got to rehearsals to really work on it it's mind blowing that no one actually plays like piano during the show and that it's just all fake because like yeah. you're watching it as an audience member and you're like, wait, I can't figure out if she's playing or not. <laughs> like, oh no, I know it's, um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a good, it's a good part of the show. I really enjoy it. I mean, I, I honestly thought that, um, you know, 
be, an actor might be able to play live, but because they've got to fly that huge grand piano, there's no way that could be a real piano. Be like they had to empty it to make it light enough to fly. Yes, no, that that well, totally. I'm not, supposed to, I'm not sure if I'm actually supposed to be giving away that secret. <laughs> I, I mean, but that that totally makes sense, though. Uh, so 1,200 performances, as I mentioned earlier, it's a huge accomplishment. What made you want to stay in the show for as long as you did and perform? as Carol night after night? Um, well, goodness. Um, first of all, I, it's a great show. It's a great part. And, you know, I've played really, really trying parts before, like, you know, for instance, Grapes of Wrath, right? I've, I've done that play before and played Rosa Sharon and it's, and it's a beautiful play, but it's not something I could do for longer than maybe eight or nine months just because it's so dark. Um, the lo lovely thing about Carol is that even though she goes through a bit of an emotional journey and there's very, very hard times in the show, she's a very, she's a positive glass half full kind of bright, sunny person. Yeah. So stepping into those shoes every day is a lot easier than <laughs> even like somebody like Evita, right? You know, you're like, that intensity is, is difficult to do every day. But with Carol, it's, it's, um, it's easier. And the music is, I've never gotten tired of it in all the years that I did it. Um, and you know, and it's, there's, it being the, you know, I was the longest running Carol on Broadway and that was, you know, I'm proud of that. And I'm, I was excited to come to work every day. I love the people that I work with. I loved everything about that building. It felt like a family. Um, also, you know, I, I have a son. And so, you know, to have a steady job and one that you love as an actor, that's hard to come by, you know, like, yeah. So, you know, everybody said, hang on to that as long as you can. It's a great job. You know, we're so lucky that we can even call it a job. You know, um, I just kept reminding myself every day I walked into the building, I reminded myself how lucky I was and what a privilege it was and an honor to be able to step into her shoes and to be able to do, you know, do that performance for all those people every night. How do you think it stayed fresh to you every night? And like, it's like entertaining to go into the theater. Well, the, the thing that I always tell people is that acting is about listening. It's about making it about the other person and not about you. It's never about your performance, right? It's also always about what you're trying to get from the other person, what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to communicate. And so even if you're doing a one woman show, and I just did one recently, you know, it was always about the imaginary person who's either on the phone with you or like in the audience or what, whatever. Um, and so we had a fantastic cast and we had, you know, people would go in and out, we'd have understudies on. And so it always kept things fresh because you, it, your job is to listen. It's not just like, oh, this is what I do here. It's like, what did you say? And reacting as if it's the very first time. And if you think about it, you know, it's it's somebody's it's always somebody's anniversary birthday first time they've ever been to a Broadway show first time they've been to a show ever in general there's somebody you know like that out out in the audience every single night we've had you know I've met Paul McCartney we've had like all of these incredible people come and see our shows you know so you never know who's gonna be there like Carol showed up herself you know what I mean and I've worked with Carol before like you never know if they're gonna be there so treating it like Every performance is special, even those matinees on Wednesdays when you're not, you know, you'd rather be in bed, but you're, you know, you're not, you don't, you actually, it's not true. You wouldn't rather be in bed because what you're sharing with the people is so special. Um, so really it's about listening. And I also liken it to a yoga practice. You know, if you do like Bikram yoga or one of those practices, you know, you go to the, your mat and the poses are the same. But even though you're doing the same postures, you're a different person every single time you come to the mat. So you've got to check in. It's like, oh, you know, my tree pose is a little different today than it was yesterday. And if you're really centered and in the moment, it, it, it can never get boring because you're, you're truly listening, listening to your body, making sounds in a different way than you did yesterday and listening in a different way to the art artistry that is coming from those other brilliant thoroughbreds that you're in the race with, right? Yeah, and it's like, as... As I always mention, as I mentioned earlier, like it's never the same show probably to you. Like it's no. always a little bit different depending on the audience reactions. And yes, well, that's it. And the audience is always different too, right? And I was learning things after four years on Broadway. I was learning new things even at year four. I couldn't believe it. I was like, how am I learning this now? Like, have I not done enough performances? But you keep learning. As long as you stay open to it, you keep learning. What was meeting Carol like? I know, I'm sure you got to work with her several times over the years, but initially when you first met Carol, what was, what was that like? 
Oh my gosh. It was, well, it was nerve wracking. I got an email from her. I was, it was like from a Carol dash in my, e in my inbox. And I was like, Oh geez, I don't have any friends named Carol. Oh my God. It's Carol King. <laughs> oh, her. <laughs> she said, you know, I hear you're great in the show. I'm going to come and see you. Do you want to know when I'm coming? And I was like, clear, please, please, Miss King, do not tell me when you're coming. Cause I'll have surprise me <laughs> and she was so sweet she was you know the, she's such a gracious grounded person like I keep saying but she was really really sweet you know she and it was it, it was a joke in the company that you know every time there was any kind of commotion in the audience everyone was like it's Carol she's here and I was like shh you know get all nervous <laughs> don't tell me <laughs> don't tell me it's not gonna help me so anyway she came in disguise she surprised us backstage she was so lovely so gracious and you know if I had thought I knew Carol before that, I didn't until I met her. Like sitting down with her, seeing her play the piano, singing with her, hearing her stories, seeing her do impressions of Jerry, you know, seeing her do impressions of all of these different people in her life and telling us like the inside scoop. It was just amazing. And her sense of humor and meeting her daughters, you know, like I think I was the most emotional when I met Louise because she's the spinning image of Carol. She's this gorgeous, you know, singer songwriter, so vulnerable. And I hold her in the show like she's my daughter, you know, and at the time that I started the show, I had a five month old baby myself. And I was holding this little fake, you know, five month old. Yeah. Movie, but I know what that is to have a, a child and, and that journey that the child has in the show, even though we don't see her, she's not really a character, but to Carol, she's a huge character. Um, so to meet that person, I mean, oh my gosh, I just almost like I burst into tears. Like I felt like, I mean, she's, you know, yeah. I think she's like my age or older than I was. And I was just like, come here. <laughs> I just wanted to squeeze her. That's so inspirational for her to get to like watch someone take on the role of her mom on stage and like get to see stuff from maybe before she remembers get to see like parts of carol's story from before she remembers yeah and i'm sure it's mixed like i can't imagine going to see a show about my mom and you know with me in it and going like oh, how do i feel about this like it must be very very vulnerable for those people i mean but how incredible to have carol in the audience and like have her like trust you to take on the role of her yes. and like she, how many times did she come to see you in it? Well, she doesn't like seeing the show. So she only came to see it one time, but she did come backstage numerous times. And she did like the curtain call with me. There was the one time where she came and, su and surprised everybody and did. So like I would come off and then for Carnegie Hall, instead of me coming on, it was actually Carol. And then she played and sang, um, the uh you know you've got to get up every morning she did the final number beautiful in the show and everybody went wild and then we did the curtain call together and we sang the curtain call together so like there was that moment and then there was you know just other times where we did like the today show together and stuff that you know there were all those those moments but she only actually came to see it uh with me in it one time i think she saw it once with jesse and once with me what a special memory to have or a bunch of special memories do you mm -hmm. have a favorite particular memory from those 1,200 performances or your time with Beautiful? Um, well, getting to meet her and work with her uh, was probably, yeah, definitely the, the, the top. Um, and, you know, we just, we got to do so many things like um, meeting Paul McCartney was a big one. Um, <laughs> you know, there's just so many incredible people. Uh, Ted Danson, like there's Olivia Newton-John, like all these amazing, like, people and stars that I had looked up to for so long. Um, oh gosh, you know, getting to do all the different appearances. I mean, every time I got to represent the show anywhere um, was exciting. People loved it, you know, and, and I, I just loved going on the morning shows and then singing and also bringing it home to Toronto and being like, look, this is a thing that I've been working on for the last few years. And now I get to bring it home to Toronto and share it with you before I go back there again it was so exciting. It's like representing your school kind of, I feel like. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a home game, right? It's For like, I'm so school. proud of this. Like, here, here it is. Please yeah. enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So last question about Beautiful. You, since you did it over uh, 1,200 times, how did you work on vocal stamina? And like, when you sang, this, when you sang the songs eight times a week for as long as you did? The, the wonderful thing about Carol's sound is that she has a, a what is naturally a very healthy sound. So it's it's placed in a forward way and it's not um, it's not a very like thick sound, which can sometimes, you know, sit on your chords. And so I really just got into what, 
you know, what her sound was like putting it in my mask and in my, in my nose and really allowing it to be this kind of bright, um, not too heavy sound. And the great thing about the way that she sang is that if you can let it be raw, you can let it be messy. Like that's what makes it so cool and so fun to sing. You can let it be growly and, and, um, and a little messy as long as it's sitting in a bright place that does not put any weight here, then you're fine. One of my friends texted me when I asked if she had questions earlier and mm -hmm. said, tell her that she has the most iconic growl placements in the show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I sang Carol, like it doesn't, it's not me, right? Everyone was like, I can't believe what you did with your voice because anyone who knows my voice, I don't sound like that at all. So I really studied her and I listened to like numerous, numerous, numerous recordings for like months before I started rehearsals for the show. I studied like her phrasing and like how she makes that, that sound and really tried to vibrate on that frequency, you know? And, um, and then, yeah, I noticed like as I kept working on it, um, it just, it, it fits nicely and your voice starts to kind of mold to what that thing is and you learn how to do it, you know, even if you're not feeling a hundred percent or you're, you know, you're a little tired that day or you've been talking a little bit too much that day, you figure out where to place it. And then doing that many shows, like I know how to do that show when I'm sad, when I'm happy, when I'm <laughs> feeling low energy, when I'm feeling high energy, when I don't feel like crying, you know, when I'm feeling vocally fatigued, like we've got, I've got those techniques down because it, and it probably made it even like more entertaining because like when you're feeling certain ways, it's different. You, it's different for the audience every night. So like repeat audience members get to come see you play it in different ways and put different emotional spins on it, depending on like how the day is, how the week is, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it taught me a lot about acting too, where you don't have to be in the state to be able to play the role. You know, you can feel, you can have, be having a very bad day and go in and play a happy character because it's not about you. It's not about me, right? It's, it's about what she's going through, right? And to play what it is that I'm supposed to play. Like it, it really did remind me that acting is about the other person and trying to get what it is that you want instead of I'm feeling so sad right now or I'm feeling this or I'm feeling that. That's not, not actually what acting is. That, okay, that's, a, that's interesting. Um, so what was your favorite song night after night to sing? Did it change? Oh, that would change, but for, I mean, I guess, uh, oh boy, that's a hard one to answer. I'd say probably Natural Woman is up there. And Will You Love Me Tomorrow. God, I love that song. It's oh, yes. a really great song. And it's so simple. It's um, stunning. Yeah, there's some great songs. They're all great. Um, but I would say, yeah, Natural Woman kind of takes the cake. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So recently you went out, or kind of recently, you went out on tour with Bands Visit. Yes. Athena. How is that, I have to ask, how is that balancing a tour with like your life? Because as you mentioned, you have a son, like that's crazy to, to like be going on tour and be balancing mom life at the same time. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, it's not easy at all. Um, I I mean, I only signed on for six months because I felt like that was all I could do uh, with, you know, with my son, with not knowing exactly how to, you know, because he's in school. I mean, it's, it's tricky. Um, but the wonderful thing is that the six months... Um, Oh, the six months overlapped with the summer period really well. So I was able to travel with him and, you know, his dad and I co-parent like really, really well. Like he and I have known each other for over 20 years. And so it was lovely to, you know, be able to be flexible with him. And, you know, my parents were helping and there was just, there were so many, um, there were so many uh, supportive people around making that all work, you know? So it was, it was great. Has he gotten to see you on stage in shows? Oh. Yeah, yeah. He used to love coming to Beautiful. Um, I mean, when I was first, uh, right after I gave birth, seven weeks after I gave birth, I played Mary Poppins uh, in Canada. So oh. he's been part of it for a long time. <laughs> Maybe he'll go up to be, a, to be a theater kid too. Oh, who knows? My goodness. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, he loves it. He definitely loves it. He loved the band's visit. He was wild. Oh. He just, he, you know, he loved all the music. He became very close with everybody in the cast. He actually started learning how to play the Darbuka. He was really incredible. Now, I, 
what specifically is the band's visit about for people who didn't get to see it it was obviously it obviously won tony's it's a huge show that had that had a pretty great amount of success it didn't last as long as it probably should have so people didn't get to come to see it not like for five years etc mm-hmm. but but it had a lot of success while it was on broadway Yes, it did. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's in a very, very interesting show because a lot of people are like, well, what is it about? Like, it seems like it's about nothing, but it's not about nothing. It's about this. Well, it's about a, a band, um, a military or a, sorry, a police band who uh, get lost and they end up in this very small town um, where they are greeted by the locals and taken in for the night. And so it's basically like two cultures that would normally be at war with each other. Uh, having to sort of get along for this evening and figuring out each other's customs and playing music together. And that's the beautiful third language of the show is music. So there's, you know, all of this issue with like language and what are you saying and the pronunciations and not on, like missing signals and all of this stuff. But it's what they end up teaching each other at the end of their journey. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful story. It's very uh, subtle and delicate and... Um, you know, full of, um, full of loss and sadness and also a, an a immense amount of joy. Um, I just loved it. I, I think it's a beautiful story. I watched a video of you singing one of the songs in it last night. And how do you work on the pronunciation for the songs in the show? Because like, you're not singing it. You're not singing like Carol King. You have a completely different accent. It's very, very different. Yes. Well, I had to speak, um, oh God, I had to speak Hebrew and Arabic in the show and do all of these different accents. And it was, um, well, not all of these different accents. I mean, one main one, but it's, it's difficult because I grew up speaking French. The, uh, the accent is very, it's like similar in certain ways to French, but different enough that it made it difficult for me because my go-to is some of the French pronunciations, which are not right. So I had to work with a couple of different, I had to work with, uh, uh, a couple of different, um, you know, uh, dialogue coaches, um, and yeah, they were fantastic. Uh, one was Zohar, and she she was just amazing doing the um, doing the Israeli accent. That was the biggest one, and then I did have some coaching as well on the Arabic. Because um, also, you know, when 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 I was speaking Arabic, it yeah. had to be the Israeli person speaking Arabic. So you had to put the Israeli accent on top of the Arabic accent. Do you understand? So it's like oh layers goodness. of like authenticity. Yeah. That's- yeah, so it was like the speaking the two languages and then the accents when you're speaking English. It was fascinating. How long did that take to like study and perfect during the rehearsal process? It was a lot. It was a it was a lot. It was a lot of training the ear and like things that I thought that I was doing correctly. Yeah. Um, you know, it would be the difference between like eh and eh. And I was like, what? Uh, What's the difference? Like, I can't hear it, but you know, other people could hear it. So it just, you know, we had to be very, very, very mindful to do it accurately. And you know, people who were fluent speakers would come to see the show and they would think, they would start speaking to me in the language after the show. And I was like, I don't know what you're saying. They're like, oh, we thought you spoke it. So, I mean, those coaches did a great job in keeping us, you know, uh, keeping us in line in terms of the, you know, the authenticity. Is that like fulfilling as an actress to like have people come up to you after the show and like, react like that react like you put on such a believable performance on stage that they actually like believe that you're like this person almost in real life oh absolutely it's what you want you know it's what you want I mean it's funny because I used to with Jesus Christ Superstar I used to come out of the stage door I always just remember I had this you know routine that I would like get out of my makeup and I put my glasses on and I'd come out at stage you know afterwards and people were like who are you it's like I played Mary well where's your stage presence why are you wearing those glasses <laughs> what I mean that's the wonderful thing is that you transported them in such a way that they don't even believe that who you are is the person who played that character when you come up that's great it's very fulfilling it's wonderful it's like at stage door after like wicked or something when the person doesn't come out green and you just played off stage like, and they're like, yeah wait what <laughs> yeah yeah well and sometimes there's disappointment because you want that person to actually be the character right and and when they're not you're like oh right they're human beings <laughs> but it, but also at the same time it's like really cool it's like wow, you just watch this person like do a craft that like i mean yes maybe seems simple on stage because they're so good at doing it but like 
it's hard. Like yeah. it's hard to make something believable. It's hard. Well, to make it's our job to make it look easy. That's the whole. That's our task, right? And that's why it takes years and years and years and years to. Oh my gosh. Out. Yeah, and and you all do make it look easy. It's like, oh, I like I like I'm gonna go on stage right now. No, if if I went on stage and saw the lights, I would be like, what's my line? <laughs> <laughs> If I looked into the audience, heard any audience reaction, I would forget everything. So <laughs> stage fright. Who inspires you in the theater world to like keep going every day and keep being part of the theater world and doing more theater? Oh, goodness. You know what? I have so many people that I look up to. It's really, really hard to name one. But lately... Uh, because I, I run a theater company in Canada and we've got this new education program that we have started um, and I've started you know doing a lot more teaching than I used to and we're doing this mentorship program I think it's like the, it's the younger generation who is really inspiring me I see this you know them persisting during this pandemic and it really really moves me like you know kids who are continuing to take class, continuing to have hope that theater will come back and they're like not giving anything up and they're like, they're just doing it. And I, I just wonder like, you know, if, if, if myself and my colleagues were all just coming out of theater school, like how would we be handling it? You know? So I just, I have a lot of respect for them and for their persistence and their perseverance and their resilience right now. Um, you know, and then some of the, you know, the, um, the older generation, you know, like there's a, a wonderful woman who's one of my best friends who's, uh, her name is Denise Ferguson, and she's a veteran of theater, you know, all over the place. Um, and she is, you know, 86 years young. She will be on, on actually tomorrow is her birthday. And um, she's a fitness instructor. She just became a fitness instructor a few years ago, and she is like in better shape than most people I know and she has a better diet than most people I know she is fierce like one time we met up to go somewhere and she came in wearing like these like tight leather pants and heels and this jacket she had her hair all done and her makeup and I was like I need to go back inside and change because if I'm going anywhere with you I feel totally dowdy right now <laughs> you look fabulous <laughs> yeah. I mean it's people like that it's like it's all of the people who are reinventing themselves during this time and being brave I mean I've always really like since I saw her for the first time I've looked up to Cynthia Revo. like I you know I love I've loved Bernadette Peters my whole life like there's just there's so many people to look up to uh right now and um yeah so where do you where do you teach and how can people get involved with that like get involved <laughs> with that and learn from you well um thank you for asking well you can uh, uh my company is eclipsetheater.ca it's the toronto-based eclipse theater company and we've got the program called it's called the mto it's the mentorship training and opportunity program and so you can go on that uh website um, I think you just go to eclipsetheatercompany.com. That's the MTO website. And um, you you can sign up for classes. Ooh, and I'll put the link in the description for anyone watching who wants to go sign up. Because, I mean, you have so much knowledge to offer. So, like, how amazing for students to get to learn from someone in the who's been in the industry and has so much experience in the industry. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's I feel like it's a privilege to share the information because you know like uh, and and I've, I've taken this from Jen Colella because I think she's a fantastic teacher as well and you know she she always says uh, and I think it's really smart that the only difference between myself and somebody else is just that I've been on the planet longer I've been doing it longer so it's just about sh you know sharing information that could help and and oftentimes I learn a lot from my students as well like they'll you know they'll open my eyes to a new perspective or remind me of something that I did when I was younger, you know, and I'm always grateful for those classes. They're, they're inspiring. You're going to have so many students that you want to see in like their school productions of shows when theater, when like live theater and live performances come back, <laughs> you're going to be like making your schedule like, okay, I'm going to this city tomorrow to go see this student. <laughs> oh my gosh. I hope so. I just want to make sure that that, uh, that, Remind me later, I want to make sure that that uh, email address is right that I gave you because sometimes I have little brain moments. <laughs> no, per perfect, perfect. I'll, I'll remind you later and like get the email address like written down for the uh, description. Yes. Oh, that, so, that is true. That's, that's the right one that I gave you, eclipsetheatercompany.com. Done. Perfect. So 
do you have any dream role currently on on stage oh i feel boring answering this question because i always say the same thing um i god i've always wanted to play guinevere in camelot that was like one that Ooh. passed me by that i haven't gotten to do yet um geez there are so many i mean literally every musical that i have not done I want to do you know like I just want to do it all before I die um, I'd love to be in you know I'd love to play um, I'd love to play the mom and dear Evan Hansen I would love to oh my gosh there's so many so many good ones I would love to hear you sing that song the, the oh, song man. I would I would love it too I mean I think you know I used to want to play I was always torn between whether I was an Elphaba or a Glinda when I was younger and, and that show never sort of came around to me but oh. Um, I never really felt like I fit into either one of those perfectly well. Um, but I always loved the show. You know, I love that. I love that show. Um, that's funny because I always like Dreamcast people as Alphaba. So like, <laughs> I mean, I, I could see you singing Defying Gravity. I would love it. Um, there's also, uh, oh geez. There's, I mean, there's a million plays that I've always wanted to do. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's just about anything, you know, I'd love to do more Shakespeare. There's just so many, so many shows I'd love to do. You've crossed so much off your bucket list too. Like, I mean, you mentioned earlier, you did a one woman show recently. I did. And that was always the thing that scared me the most and I did it. And so, you know, <laughs> I would also like to write more like I do, I write now. And so there's, I've got about a million different ideas of shows that I want to, I want to start collaborating on with other people. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things in the bucket. And you have an album on uh, out everywhere you can find music, basically. It's called What You Find in a Bottle. Yeah. And you also wrote an original musical called Call It Love. What's this, What's your songwriting process like? How do you like even start writing songs and get the confidence to start writing songs? Oh, well, you know what? I just did. I, it's funny enough, I didn't have the confidence to play them for anybody for a long time. Um, I find that they come they come to me. They just come to me, and it sounds so cheesy and <laughs> cliche, but I feel like they're there, and it's just a matter of me tapping into what it is, and then I'm like, oh, this is what it is. Or sometimes, like, I'll be sit I'll be in the car driving, and I'm like, oh, it's doo doo da dum ba da ba da and I, like, grab my phone, I'm like, this is the hook, and then, you know, when, when I get home, I'm like, oh, and then I can do something with it. So, occasionally, like, it's a bigger idea that comes to me, and then I write the whole thing at once. Like, one time I woke up from a dream, and I wrote this huge, huge, like, finale number, uh, to the show and then you know other times it'll just be like a little thing that will eventually open up like one time I, I wrote something and then years later like maybe five or six years later that little tiny thing that I had in my phone became this big song <laughs> just Ooh. yeah that's so cool because like I always wonder how where someone starts for songwriting and for writing their own songs like to get a song written for you like that like that's that seems pretty easy I don't know, but it's probably not because then you have to fit where your voice fits in. You have to learn the song, but to write a song for yourself, like that's insane. Well, oftentimes too, I find myself writing uh, for other people, like for imaginary voices, like for voices that I, I can hear, but I don't know who they belong to. So I'll write, you know, not for me, but for, you know, like a, a, a voice with a different quality, you know, and, and I, I do, um, I do enjoy it because it gives me freedom. Like if I only think about myself singing the songs then I feel I'm limited, you know? Um, but if I, if, if my imagination is, is burst open, then I can, I can pretty much have the freedom to write whatever I want. Yes. So for those missing out on your album who haven't listened to your, to the stunning music and your amazing voice yet, how would you describe the sound of your music? Oh, well, thank you. Well, my music has now changed a lot since then because I was that album was put out a while ago now. But um, but at the time, you know, that that album is very, um, I guess, you know, if you mix like folk with pop with a little country, <laughs> it's kind of got that. Nice. Um, now it definitely has a, a different flavor. Um, What's the flavor now? And it does it like has it? Why has it grown? For you what do you think well i think just different influences um and and feeling a certain freedom with being able to write 
uh, I mean, I, I kind of used to limit myself to something that I was comfortable with, like what I was, what I grew up on, what I personally enjoyed listening to. Like I was a big Joni Mitchell fan. And so, you know, a lot of these like folk artists, I, I you know, I, from the 60s and 70s, I just, I just loved. And then I was like, what happens if I write a big rock song? Or what happens if I write, you know, uh, like if I just go with pop? Or what happens if I, you know listen to Adele for a few hours, like what comes out of me then? You know, like it, we just are influenced by, you know, whoever we're listening to in the moment. So I just really tried to, to paint with some different colors. Yeah. And just not stick to one thing, like go, like develop. Yeah. Music more and more. And I like to, 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 um, to push myself. Like I, you know, I, I'm not really a big country fan, but I, I, wrote a country song so I was like well what happens if I try to write a country song or what happens if I try to write a jazz song <laughs> so <laughs> doing those so, things so you're one of those people who's like I'm gonna do this I don't care if I'm not comfortable with doing it I'm gonna like get out of my comfort zone yeah in fact like it's almost like an addiction to me to do things that make me uncomfortable it's like <laughs> I do things constantly that push I'm always pushing myself in every way to you know to grow because it's when you feel scared when you feel uncomfortable that's when you do the most growing so it's like well if I'm not sure that I should be doing it and it terrifies me I'm like oh god I guess I have to do it because I know that that's <laughs> that's the only thing that's gonna make me braver I love that so much teach me <laughs> how to be comfortable getting out of com my comfort zone because, like, the, the thing is right even if you don't feel comfortable just do it anyway right even if you don't feel comfortable just be brave just march ahead it's all about baby steps and just moving in that direction like you're not gonna feel comfortable that's okay I didn't feel comfortable opening night of beautiful I didn't feel comfortable I was scared to death but I did it anyway I just had faith in myself that like if I just keep breathing and if I just keep doing my job I'm gonna be okay and and look they wanted to keep you for for over a thousand performances of the show. So it worked out. <laughs> so Call It Love, I saw you did a one night performance of it or there was a one night show of it. it is there any, uh, is it gonna come back in the future or is there any talk of that? Yes, there is. So we, we did uh, we did three workshops in, in and around New York City. Um, and then we did our first Canadian online uh, workshop just recently uh, with this fabulous Canadian cast, plus Jen Colella, because she's been with it from yeah. the beginning. She's incredible. And, um, and we, you know, we're, we just keep working on it. And, and now we're trying to figure out in the time of COVID and what's happening with theater, you know, what, what the trajectory is going to be, but it's very much still alive. And, you know, we're just organizing um, how best to move forward with that show, but it's definitely going to have a life. We're just trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> I was going to say, there's going to be so many amazing shows after when theater comes back. And I hope that that can be one of them. Thank you. Love, Thank you. Love, 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 love to see that on a Broadway stage oh, or any theater so stage. I appreciate you very much. Thank you for saying that. I, we're very proud of it. And like every time we do a workshop of it, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So we just, you know, we're all excited, I think, to see where it lands. To wrap up, this is one of my favorite questions. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, how do you work on self-confidence in this industry? Because I feel like it's such a tough industry to like keep going every day in. Definitely. Oh, I, that's a really good question with a, a complicated, maybe a complicated answer. I don't know. Maybe it's not complicated. Um, I guess my advice is, or my thoughts on it are, um, you don't have to be confident and battle all of your insecurity issues to make it in the industry. Like you don't have to be anywhere other than where you are right now. And that sounds like, wait a minute, because we you know entering a room, like I guess being where you are is what's gonna give you the confidence to be able to be yourself in the room, right? So yeah. even if that is like owning your insecurity and owning all the things that you're terrified of, like that, pretending like those don't exist is not gonna give you confidence. It's gonna give you this like false confidence and it's gonna be this band-aid that you put over what's really happening right so if you can just i mean all of us have fears all of us have issues with confidence that's just the truth right we talked about that before so i think the more we can just be ourselves i mean as cheesy as it sounds and be authentic and really genuinely believe in that authenticity and that that's enough like that's all you can do. And I mean, if you're nervous walking into a room and you feel insecure, well, welcome to the club. We all do. Like, that's just something that never goes away. And I think it actually gets worse sometimes the more success you have and the older you get because 
you're like, oh, well, now I'm walking into a room and before nobody knew me and I, it wasn't a big deal. The stakes weren't high, but now everybody knows me. They're like, oh yeah, let's see what she brings. Let's see. I've seen her in this show. I bet she's not as good now. Like there's all of these things that, you know, like little voices in your head that keep talking to you. And, you know, just, um, the more we can sort of soften that voice or, you know, like, Get the other voices to be just a little bit louder to go a little easy on ourselves that also happens when we go easy on other people too like the softer we are about accepting other people for who they are celebrating their artistry making space for other people like knowing that there are enough seats at the table for everybody and if there isn't we'll build another table and create more jobs right so we just have to sort of um i think we have to be supportive of each other and then and supportive of ourselves and it has to start with yourself because if you're not gentle on yourself and accepting of yourself then how can you be accepting of anybody else yeah so big long answer all to say that i don't think getting over confidence and insecurity issues is easy and i don't think that people should have this false expectation that that's something that is even doable like i don't think that suddenly just because you're however old and you've got this many Tony awards or nominations or successes, then that means that you've like managed to figure all that out. It, Nobody does. <laughs> they just find ways of coping with it, you know, as, it, as we get older. Yeah. And I was going to say, as you get older and to you get like wiser and you also with the wise, with the wiser, it comes with more overthinking. So it's like, you have to battle that continuously. And there's certain things like perspective too, right? Like as you get older too, you realize, you know, as you've had, I mean, not to be sort of um, heavy, but you know, as you get older, like you start to understand the value of certain things. Like you have kids, people die, you lose people, you know, people get divorced. Like you, you suffer some like real life things and you start to realize that like, oh, if I don't book that commercial, it's actually not the end of the world. Yeah. And you start to also realize that the people on the other side of the table are just regular people like you and I. So the people making those decisions, I mean, are they the most brilliant people? I mean, I have a great amount of respect for a lot of them and I have a great amount of respect for a lot of actors, but they're just people, right? We're all just people. We're all just people trying to make this stuff happen. We're all trying to make art. So sometimes like we put, you know, so much on getting this job or like oh, that person must know everything because they're the ones doing the casting. Well, you know, like just try to remember that we're all people at the end of the day, we all go home. We all have insecurities. Even the people who are directing, even the people who are casting, all of those people are just human beings, just like the rest of us. <laughs> so the more you can maintain perspective, I think the healthier people will be. They're all doing their jobs at the end of the day and trying to do their jobs as best they can. Yeah. So all we can do is just take care of our own self and keep learning. You know, I think the more information people have, the more experience people have, the more confident they are. Um, so just, you know, keep taking class, keep learning from the people that you admire and respect and, and uh, work on your craft. Um, I mean, another thing that I'm going to steal from Jen Colella is that she says <laughs> the, only, the only two things you're in control of are preparation and attitude. And that's true, right? And I think that that's brilliant. When I heard her say that, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, you like be prepared, learn your stuff and just show up, you know, like be yourself show up and have a great attitude. Like half of the battle of getting hired is, are you a nice person to work with? <laughs> Cause let me tell you, there's like the talented person who's not great to work with, who's got a bit of an attitude and an ego or the really talented person who's nice. Who do you want to work with? I mean, I can tell you my pick, right? Like, yes. Cause you I, have to like put on this false, you know, I'm nice to everybody personality, but be genuinely, sincerely yourself and kind to others. And that will actually help to get you in the room. Yeah, be someone who people want to show up to work with every day. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and a good collaborator, right? Because every but like theater is about collaboration, and that means collaborating on the page and about the work, and it also means collaborating in terms of like, hey, how are you feeling today? How are you doing? Do you want to run those lines? Do you want to do this? Oh, it's not my time to talk right now. This is my time to listen. Right? That's also being a good collaborator. And speaking of that, I'm like as I mentioned earlier theater people are resilient. They found a way to make it work over Zoom, over the internet, but yeah. I'm sure it's harder over the internet. What are you most excited about when live theater can come back and everyone can be in the same space again? Oh boy, <laughs> I'm excited about the electricity that happens when people are in the same space, the, the breathing together, the um, 
that thing that we, we can't get right now as much as we, like this is a lot better than being on the phone, right? This is a lot better than so many things because I can see your face, but the okay. one thing that we can't do right now is we can't breathe together. We, you know, there is a screen between us and, you know, there's a, a name for that and that's called film and television. It's not supposed to be theater. Theater is supposed to be, you know, you over here, me over here, and we're breathing together and having this collective experience that you just cannot trade for anything. So I guess, yeah, breathing together in the same space and sharing real time uh, yeah. theater is... I mean, it sounds general and, and, and pretty simple, but that's it. I can't wait to just grab a fellow actor and be able to like breathe in their face and sing something together, you know? <laughs> like without a mask. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Is there an overture that you would hear for the first time when theater comes back and you would just like immediately like start bawling? Like any specific overture? Probably Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, that one also, oh, you know, one that always gets me is it's so exciting is Mamma Mia, you know, or like the intermission, yeah. you know, when it goes like it just go and everybody always has a heart attack when they play it because you're not expecting it. And then that <laughs> intermission you know, guitar starts. That's a fun one. Just when the curtain goes up at like, and or opens during a show when theater comes back, like it's going to be a mess for me. <laughs> Honestly, any live music, like an, a live orchestra. I mean, I got to sing with the symphony during COVID, which was incredible and everybody was distanced. But even that, hearing those instruments, the brass players, like, oh my goodness, I, my, I was so moved. I was like one of the best experiences of my life. And it made me learn not to take it for granted ever, ever, ever again. There's something just different about like hearing it live in person and getting goosebumps and stuff. Yeah, because that vibration is actually going through the air and hitting me in real life time, right? It's not yeah. through something else. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So lastly, is there anything else that you've been working on, whether it's music related or not, that you want to promote that I didn't touch on? Oh, you're so sweet. Oh, my goodness. Um, oh, I think you pretty much touched on everything. The the musical, the the theater company, the education program is the big one. Um yeah, no, no. I mean, I've, you know, I've got some, I'm, I'm lucky that I've got some exciting things coming up. Oh, one thing is I'm doing a play reading with Eric McCormick. I'm Ooh. doing um, The Great Gatsby oh. with um, Talk is Free Theater. So I don't know if anybody wants to tune into that, but I'm very excited about it. I love Eric and this is the first time that we've actually gotten to work together. So that's going to be fun. Where can people watch that? Oh, well, it's called, um, my goodness, it's called Dinner a la Art. Oh, that's what they're calling it. Yes, it's um, yeah, Dinner a la Art. Uh, it's an online play uh, reading initiative. So I think you can go to probably Talk is Free Theater and uh, and get, you know, figure out how to watch it that way. Oh, I'll put all the links to everything in the description once again for people watching. So where can people follow you on social media to keep up with you and to find more inspirational uh, to find more inspirational stuff from you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, if you just go to Ashleena Kennedy on Instagram, it's funny because I was hacked a while ago and then I lost my whole account and all my followers, but I was able to come back, thank goodness. So I'm just recently back on it. So if you go to Ashleena Kennedy, I've got a blue check mark. And then, um, yeah, I've got a Facebook page, Ashleena Kennedy. Um, it's all Ashleena Kennedy. Fantastic. Well, it's been so much fun to talk to you about your insane theater resume. We've done, you've done it all. Oh, thank you. You've been so sweet. It was lovely to spend the hour with you. Thanks for watching this episode of Backstage with Becca B. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Becca B Talks TV. Or for more exclusive content from this interview and more, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Backstage with Becca B. Make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and give me a five-star rating. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!